Master Wayne, I've completed the modifications to your bat suit. That's great, Alfred. Were able to work in all of my requests. Indeed, sir. I've reinforced your suit with Kevlar, fireproof your cape, and I've also. Did. I've... Did you scalp my butt like I asked you? Indeed, sir. And the nipples? Sir, again, I don't see the. I'm not interested in excuses, Alfred. Indeed, sir. Welcome to another fun, exciting edition of Good Times and Bad Movies. I'm Paul Ireland. Joining me as always is my fantastic co-host, the boy wonder himself, Tim Morrison. How are you, sir? Oh, I'm great, Paul. How are you? I'm fantastic, Tim, uh, because this week we're actually talking about 1995's Batman Forever from Warner Brothers. Um, but before we get into that, we should just uh, remind you guys quickly that here that... Um, Tim and I, we're on social media, so you can find us uh, on Instagram at Good Times Bad Movies. Uh, check us out. We're always posting clips, and uh, we have a YouTube page, too, so check it out. The episodes are there as well, and you can find us on Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. So check it out, download us, and uh, if you're on iTunes as well, give us a review and let us know what you guys think, because we want to hear from you. Um, so before we get into this, maybe uh, we'll give you a quick synopsis in case you haven't seen this Batman, because there are a lot of Batmans in the uh, DC universe here. Um, but this is sort of the first in set of incarnations of Batman. So, Tim, why don't you hit us with a little synopsis and uh, let the folks at home know what uh, Batman Forever is about. So Batman must battle former district attorney Harvey Dent, who is now Two-Face, and Edward Nigma, the Riddler, with the help from an amorous psychologist and a young circus acrobat who becomes his sidekick. Mm, that's going to be Robin. <laughs> I like how they call uh, Chase Meridian an amorous psychologist. Amorous. Yeah, because as we go through this movie here, we're going to see, man, she is hot for Batman. And as she says herself, it's the uh, it's the rubber. I think that's what she said. So, yeah, she is quite hot and bothered for Batman. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, this is this is a pretty fun entry into the Batman franchise. I know that uh, the first one, obviously, with Michael Keaton and uh, Jack Nicholson, that is the uh, the gold standard for these Tim Burton uh, Batman movies. And it's honestly, in in the whole Batman franchise anyways, I would say, in my opinion, it's it's one of the better uh, installments of, um, one of the better installments of, of Batman. Um, this one, however, is uh, not so much. I mean, uh, we should just, we should just mention this quickly here. The, uh, the, the nipples on the suit in this one. And uh, they even give Robin nipples in this one too. Yeah. I mean, what's a boy of wonder with no nipples, right? So the first two movies were directed by Tim Burton. And now the Batman Forever before Batman and Robin, the George Clooney one. These are considered the Joel Schumacher movies. And yeah, the, the they're significantly different. It's a lot brighter. And yeah, we get a lot of changes to the Batsuit and stuff. Like you just said, nipples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot more of a, a toned a toned buttocks on Batman himself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is like, uh, I, you know what? Again, just, I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, Batman is the, this pretty sheer. Yeah, and the biggest notice, the biggest thing I noticed in this movie is that it's so much more bright. This looks like a rave sweat fever dream. Like I'm just, <laughs> just green neons all over the place. But we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah, that is correct. I don't, I mean, I think this one, I think because the first two were sort of dark. I mean, the second one, they tried to make a little bit lighter, but Danny DeVito already and him just being the penguin is, was kind of horrific. So I think they, they kind of scared the crap out of people with the first two. And then, so they were ordered to make something a little more family friendly, maybe a little more comic booky, you know, hence the, the bright palette and stuff like that. It just looks like you're in Tokyo or something, this entire movie. It's this weird, um, like Tron world that you're in. Did you know that the reason why Tim Burton stepped away, or I guess I don't know if he stepped away, but the reason why he didn't wasn't as involved with the uh, the Batman Forever and Batman and Robin is because McDonald's was actually very upset with Warner Brothers over how atrocious, like and scary looking, the Penguin was in Batman Returns. <laughs> really? Yeah, they wanted to make it more kid friendly because 
I guess I guess it's actually very, very important for McDonald's to be part of the Batman movies. Maybe we should just start talking about Batman Forever here because we were just kind of dancing around it. So let's just jump right into this sucker. Well, it was the summer of 1995. <laughs> Are you taking us back? <laughs> yeah. You're taking us back in a trip. Okay, go ahead. Set the scene, Tim. Yeah, it was the summer of 1995. Actually, you know what? This movie looks like it takes place in the 60s. Anyways, this movie came out in 1995, but we look like we're in 1960s Gotham. If you, did you notice the cars that are in this? They look like they're like, fi- like 57 or 67 Chevys. Yeah, there's a bit of a Dick Tracy vibe going on in this. And even the people with the cameras, they have like the old timey sort of big flash bulbs. I don't, I figured, you know, in 1995, everyone's got a normal, I mean, they have probably something that resembles what we would use today, a modern kind of camera, right? Not this giant thing with this line like, hey, smile for me, you know, so it does have an old timey vibe to it. I think that's part of it. You don't really know which era you're in with, with this Gotham, um, could be in the seventies, could be in 1995, maybe, you know, who knows? So this movie starts with uh, a credit roll of all the famous people that are in this movie. We got Val Kilmer as Batman, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face, and Nicole Kidman as Dr. Chase Meridian, and Chris O'Donnell as Robin. As soon as the credits are done, we see Batman is going to his, he's in his Batcave, and he's going to his Bat closet to get all his Bat gear out for uh, because the bat signal is in this guy. So he's grabbing all these <laughs> like kind of nameless little bat weapons. One of them looks like a grappling hook and the other ones just look like things. They just look like things that are shaped like the bat signal and stuff. I don't really know what they are. They're like batarangs. They're batarangs. I'm pretty sure you throw them at people. It's like a boomerang. And it... Some of them look like uh, those little like those things that people use for keychains, but they're actually for uh, ca- like rock climbing. Like a carabiner? Yeah. Well, it's like one of those. I don't, I don't know. know. Maybe, maybe he puts his bat. He's, he's Batman. If you, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but he's very bat oriented with a lot of his stuff. So maybe at a home, he's got like forks and knives that are shaped like bats. Like oh, they don't cut that well, but uh, they like the look of them. So, so once he's all suited up, he turns around, he's ready to go. And Alfred asks him, he said, would you like me to prepare a sandwich? And Val, first words out of Batman's mouth in this movie is. I'll take drive through. There was that. The only point of that was for the commercial. Now I do remember the toys. I don't remember where they're from, but I do remember the commercials. And then there was also wasn't there? There was like a maybe in the maybe it was in the next one. There was like a, a Mastercard or Amex commercial or something they had for something that was in the next one. Yeah, because Batman has one in the movie. Yeah, and he's like, I never go anywhere without the card. And he's got a he's got a little bat card, I guess, that he swipes somewhere. Like, but you can imagine that you're at Dunkin' Donuts and this bat the Batmobile pulls up and he's like, ah. It's like a large coffee and a couple of coolers. Like, <laughs> and then this guy comes up. That's what the preview is for this movie. It's Batman, it's Batman going through the McDonald's drive-thru. What do you think Batman gets? Chicken nuggets? <laughs> yeah, and they're probably shaped like a Batman symbol. This is 1995, so maybe he was asking for pizza and then he'd be sitting there in line. Because, you know, pizza always took forever at McDonald's, right? And so he'd be sitting there like, huh, oh, damn it, it takes so long, but it tastes so good. And then, you know... Meanwhile, the 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 first bag of Gotham is just getting looted, and he's just like, "Oh, I'd get that pizza. It's really good. I'll be back." <laughs> he's the world's greatest detective, so he'll find them back anyways. Did you get a look at the Batmobile in this one? Um, yes, I did. There's there's a a one point in this movie that it looks like it has like a couple different fins on the top of its head, but in this one, it's got a, like a shark fin on it or something. I, I this is to me a goofy incarnation of the Batmobile. I wasn't a big fan of this one. When I was little, I loved it. I thought this was the coolest looking Batmobile ever. Just because of like all the edges on it and like the neon blue and fire coming up the back. It was just looked really cool. I thought I thought it was really neat, but it looks stupid. Like it doesn't (laughs) look like a it it doesn't look like a tactical uh, vehicle in any kind of way. I don't understand why that's a viable vehicle for Batman to use. It's impressive to look at, but it doesn't look like something you'd be like sneaking around in or. I don't know. It doesn't look like a very versatile vehicle to me. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that, that's a fair. That's a fair thought. Honestly, I prefer the um, the one in the first Batman, the, the first 1989 Batman. That Batmobile is pretty sweet. That one's really wicked. And then uh, also too, I think the one obviously from the 66 Batmobile. I think that's kind of a fun one as well too. So Batman's going out now, and it looks like uh, he's going to square off against Two Face. So Two Face is in a bank here, 
and uh, he's holding a bunch of people hostage. So Batman is on the way to uh, to save the day. He's already killed two two policemen as well. They said. Looks like his smart idea is he's going to put this guy, this this uh, I guess he's a security guard or something, <laughs> this whiny security guard. He's going to put him inside of a vault, and slowly fill it up with some acid, and hopefully Batman's going to come in time to save him. And uh, you know, this is where we get to meet like where uh, Two Face is revealed to us. And like I said before, it's Tommy Lee Jones playing him. And he's standing over the security guard, kind of taunting him a little bit and kind of explains why he uses a coin to make all of his decisions, like two sides of a coin. Uh, I guess like that's a play on him being Two-Face. And here's why, here's his reasoning for it. Luck, blind, stupid, simple, <laughs> do da clueless. <laughs> you know, I got to say, Tommy Lee in this movie, I I haven't seen, I mean, I've seen movies with Tommy Lee Jones, maybe not a lot of them, um, but it seems like when we, um, we watched Under Siege before and man, okay, he was over the top in that one. Like he, he's over the top in this one as well too. And when we meet Jim Carrey later as the Riddler, he is also over the top. So you have these two over the top guys going over the top in this entire movie. I think that's because Jim Carrey was basically doing a a, re, a reenactment or new updated version of the Riddler from the classic Batman and Robin cartoon or cartoon. Sorry, the Batman and Robin show. Like, do you remember that Riddler from the 60s? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what Jim Carrey is doing in this movie. Well, we can talk about this later, but this is like, I mean, Tommy Lee Jones is, he's going off the, off the wall in this movie. And then, uh, between him and him and the Riddler, this is, it just, it just, it's, it's a just nutty, <laughs> this entire movie. Jim Carrey is doing a version of the Riddler and because of that character, that version of the Riddler is such an like gregarious, jovial character. Now, Tommy Lee Jones has to keep up with Jim Carrey. So I think that's why he's like completely going over the top. That Jim Carrey sets this crazy, zany standard. And now Tommy Lee Jones feels like he needs to keep up. So he's just going wacky too. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah, and I guess. I think, I think there is a part to Two-Face that is going between chaos and order, right? Because that's half his face. That's half his body. He was a lawyer before too. And now he's obviously a murderer. But... You, you can see these personalities kick in and back and forth. Yeah, but he does go from quiet to extreme. But he he seems like he does that in uh, in Under Siege as well, too, because he's just he goes quiet and then he just starts exploding with so much energy. And it's it's really funny to watch it through this entire movie. Yeah, his character in this is definitely closer to his character in Under Siege. Yeah, and you know, apparently, too, um, I didn't get to look too much into it, but apparently there was a bit of a feud between him and Jim Carrey um during the making of this movie he told jim carrey that he hated him yes yes okay yes you saw that too that's hilarious <laughs> he, yeah he, he, he like jim carrey saw him in a restaurant or something and he and uh he stood up and hugged him and he whispered to him he's just like oh, i hate you yeah he said i hate i hate you i hate you so much yeah <laughs> it's just funny though because he it because he he goes just as nuts in this movie too so I mean, how can you get mad at a guy for going off the wall if you're going off the wall, right? I don't know. I just thought that was so weird. That was, that was like, I mean, you're you're doing the same thing Jim Carrey's doing. Jim Carrey is just doing Ace Ventura. That's all he's doing. If you put Ace Ventura in a Riddler costume, that's all he's doing in this movie. You know, aside from doing the pelvis thrusts or whatever, like it's 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 Ace Ventura. Um, but there you go. Anyways, right about now. Um, Funk's old brother, Batman, <laughs> slides in, in uh, and he comes down to meet Commissioner Gordon. And the first time we also get to meet Chase Meridian, who's played by Nicole Kidman. And Nicole Kidman in this movie is just absolutely stunning to look at in every scene, I gotta say. And like, like we said before, she is hot for Batman. And every time she sees Batman, there is so much weird sexual tension in this movie it's like this guy in a rubber suit <laughs> and and this very um amorous as they put it uh nicole kidman 
I really like how Batman just drops out of the sky into the crowd, like where uh, with Jim Gordon and Nicole Kidman, Chase Meridian, we'll call her, I'm going to try and call her by her name. They think that she can help reason with True Face a little bit. Batman just kind of free drops right into the crowd beside Jim Gordon and Chase Meridian. And Chase Meridian just starts flirting with Batman. She's like, I've read a lot about you. I bet I could write a good paper about a guy who likes to dress up as a bat. And then he starts like quoting some of her work. And then Jim Gordon's like, hey, you guys, can we reason with these with Two-Face here and save these guards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. They're just they're both just kind of sizing each other up there sexually. And, and he's like, hey, guys, can we save this guy who he's about to just melt with some acid before we do this? Because it, it, they, it didn't really explain it, too, because she just shows up and she's like we said before, she's hot, hot. For Batman for no reason she loves this guy I mean I guess he's a he's a mysterious guy you know he uh, he looks pretty good in his little rubber suit there I don't know a little bit of maybe she's into cosplay Batman decides he's gonna go in Batman walks through the crowd and into the building and gets in the elevator to go upstairs to meet Two-Face I thought that was hilarious because Batman usually I would expect him to like sneak around or something but he's just gonna take the elevator up <laughs> Two faces upstairs, and he says, let's start this party off with a bang. And this giant wrecking ball like plows through the building behind him and breaks the wall out. Because it's just part of his very, very elaborate plan. And then the elevator starts dinging because, you know, it's coming up to the floor. And I don't know why, but Two-Face already knows that it's Batman. Did you understand that? I guess maybe it's because he assumed he's the only one ballsy enough to come up there. Yeah, he's the only person that's ballsy enough to get in an elevator to stop a hostage situation. I guess so. I mean, you're right. It totally lacks the element of surprise. I thought it was weird that Two-Face just didn't wait for the elevator doors to open because he just, as soon as the elevator is about to open, he yells at his guys to just start shooting at the door. And they just unload on the door for about three seconds and then the door opens and there's no one there. Wouldn't you just want to wait? I mean, it sounds to me like you have this guy sort of, you know, euchred a bit. You could just wait for him to come out and be like, yeah, your move, smart guy. No, but Batman was hiding on the ceiling and all four guys, all four guys go in at once and peek their heads in the look. And Batman just kind of like kicks them all out at the same time and proceeds to individually kick all of their asses. It's, this is this movie has like. Uh, putty fighting. Do you know what I mean by putties? Yeah, from Power Rangers. Yes, that's right. The bad guys from Power Rangers. Yeah. It's it's like where they all take turns fighting. Like the whole group of them, they could they can't pounce on him at once. They're like, all right, I'm gonna go and get him. And he gets his ass kicked. And this another guy's like, okay, now I'm gonna go in and get him. And then he gets his ass kicked <laughs> one at a time. Yeah, I know. It's like there's there's eight of you with guns. You guys could just all draw fire on this guy at one point instead of just be like Okay, you fight. Okay, it's a fair fight. We'll do it. The, we'll do it the honest. You know, we'll do it the honest way. But uh, Batman shows up, and he runs into the vault. And no sooner does he run into the vault than the door slams shut, and him and the guard are being yanked out the side of the building by a helicopter. And I guess in the vault. Yes, and I guess this that was this whole idea was that Two Face was going to get Batman in here, fill this thing up with acid somehow. I guess it's the vault. The the little safes are filled with acid and somehow that's enough to fill this thing up, which doesn't really make sense to me, but I guess it did. And so that there you go. So now they're, it's slowly filling up with acid. And then this the whiny security guard is just whining away. And this guy is so useless in this movie. I mean, I know he's only here for this to start, but I really like this guy. Really? <laughs> I just like how like his his deliveries of his lines and how worried he is. As soon as this, the boiling acid comes out, he looks down. And he goes, whoa, whoa, my God, it's boiling acid. <laughs> and then and Batman just doesn't even like acknowledge it. And Batman's like, I got to get out of here. So he decides to open the safe from the inside the old fashioned way. He takes the guy, he takes the security guard's hearing aid and he reaches to the, hear, the hearing aid, takes it from him. And the security guard goes, that, that's my hearing aid. And then Batman takes it and puts his puts it up against his ear to the uh, to the safe door and proceeds to unlock the safe. Which, Paul, have you ever been inside of a giant safe like that? Um, I don't think so. Me, no, I don't think so. 
I haven't either, but I am wondering, do they have, do you think that they have a safe combination lock on the inside of this vault when, if you were trying to leave? Um, I don't, I don't know. That's a good... <laughs> like, is there a combination lock on the inside of the safe door? I don't know. I think it's a good question. I think it would just be, you would just be locked in there. Yeah. Wouldn't you? I, I would assume so. Maybe not. I don't know. That's a good question. I've never, I don't, I don't think I've been that far before. So I don't know what to say, um, but that's a good point. Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. Moving on. Batman with his, some of his back gear, essentially MacGyver's the safe so that it will swing. He can cut, he can cut the chain that is holding the safe to the helicopter and attach the vault to the side of the building. And when that happens, the safe falls and swings directly back into place where it was removed from. Oh, yeah, that, that totally makes sense, obviously. So now Batman is hanging by a rope ladder from the helicopter. And the helicopter is kind of just swaying all over, all over the place trying to drop Batman. While Two-Face is in the helicopter, he is on a megaphone talking to the cops and everyone who will listen, I guess, and telling everyone exactly what his plan is with the safe. <laughs> I know it's like, it's a common thing for the villains to like, you know, tell us of their plan. Like it's usually a bunch of exposition, but I don't think it was necessary for Two-Face to like actually get on a megaphone and tell everybody what his plan was. So Batman is hanging from this chain and Two-Face and the pilot of this helicopter are trying to find a way to drop Batman. And they drive through this sign attached to the top of a building, and it completely explodes. But the helicopter is still fine, and Batman, he's no longer hanging from the chain. He actually managed to get on top of the helicopter, which, again, I've never been on. I've never been on the roof of a helicopter <laughs> but okay, I feel like it's probably kind of dangerous. Oh yeah, that's what I was wondering. I was thinking, how did how did Batman's cape not get sucked up into this thing? I feel like it, it just would have went boom, and he would have just been sliced up into a hundred pieces, and probably the helicopter would have crashed into the ground. But Batman would have been just just butchered by the blades, and he would have also just fallen. And everyone would have been dead. Basically, is what I think I would have got from that. But I, I don't know. I I don't know what Batman's cape can do. Maybe it's like Spawn and it has a mind of its own. You know, it's all quiet in the cabin now, and they're not really sure what's going on. But of of course, Batman is on top of the roof of the helicopter, and he drops out. And Two Face decides to shoot his pilot. Batman drops his cape over top of the uh, windshield of the helicopter, and Two Face shoots the pilot in an attempt to shoot Batman through the windshield. Yeah, that's right. And and so and so it looks like I mean the plane is kind of headed towards the Statue of Liberty, but you know at this point Two-Face pulls out the 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 club, you know that thing from from the 90s where it would like stop your car from 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 people trying to st- turn the steering wheel and he locks the steering wheel and then kind of jumps out the back now of the plane and this plane is is going down. Again, I have a lot of questions about the laws of physics in this movie. Can you is it easy to just jump out of a helicopter with a parachute? I don't think if, I think, I, I think if you pull it right away, wouldn't you just get sucked up into the rotors again? I don't know. I would think so. I would think so. I would think so too. Yeah, I think I, I really, it doesn't make any sense. No, you think, yeah, he would just be like, ah, Batman, see you later. And he would just be fling, right into the top of the rotor, done. Right. When did the Statue of Liberty end up in Gotham? I, that's a good question too. I, I think I, it is supposed to be, um, in the comic books, I think Gotham is supposed to represent New York City, but it does. It is weird that they're just taking that landmark and they're like, no, nah, it's Gotham. Yeah, that would be big news, by the way, if a helicopter flies right into the face of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, that's that's true. But you're also in a world where apparently the penguin is a real person and runs around and, and people are dressed in leather suits like Catwoman. And and this guy has half his face burnt off and runs around holds people hostages. So I, I think to them, it's probably just like, Jesus, it happened again. All right, whatever. I think, I think eventually you just get used to it. If everyone's chasing a guy that's in a helicopter and he drops out of the helicopter in the middle of the city with a parachute on, you think they continue that that chase, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they, after Two-Face jumps out and the helicopter crashes in the Statue of Liberty, you know, Batman escapes and that's that's it. 
well, we can't get him now, boys. He's uh, he's in the air somewhere and he'll eventually land. And but, you know, that's it. We, we're just going to leave him alone. These are some top level cops. The cops. Well, I mean, that's it. I think the cops mostly rely on Batman. That's probably why why they're all super useless. They just they never go out and do anything. Right. I don't think I actually saw a cop in this movie. I know that Commissioner Gordon is a cop. But I haven't actually seen him arrest anybody or do any police work besides talk to Batman. I guess that's it. Maybe that's maybe maybe in this in this version of Gotham, they don't have a police force and it's just Batman. He's just like, oh, what is it again, guys? And they're like, someone was jaywalking. He's like, oh, I'm not dealing with this one. And maybe it's, it's <laughs> he only deals with. So basically, if you're just a, if you're a criminal or if you're if you're in a gang, he'll deal with you. If you're just like. If you're just out there stealing lottery tickets from from the gas station once or once in you know here in a while, then it, it, you're probably okay. You know, if, I think maybe Batman, maybe it's like theft under five thousand. You know, if it's if it's over five G's, he's coming after you. Maybe that's what's happening. He's got to limit it. They, they call him and he's like, "How much do they take?" All right, and he sits there and he adds it up and he's like, "Okay, okay, I'll be there in twenty minutes. I'm gonna get some. Uh, I'm gonna get some Burger King. You guys want some?" And then, and then just shows up throwing out coffees and and uh, whoppers for everybody. After all that. We're going to one of the branches of Wayne Enterprise. Um, I didn't catch the name of this place, but it's essentially a science research center. It is. And uh, this is the first time we're going to meet Jim Carrey. And there's a bunch of other scientists um, sitting there. One guy's got some weird thing on his head, like virtual reality goggles or something. And, and people are just standing there. And uh, a lot of people in lab coats. I've noticed that these are all apparently scientists. If you have a lab coat, <laughs> it's uh, you're a scientist. So this is the first time we're gonna meet Jim Carrey. And Jim Carrey in this, I thought, kind of looked sort of like a '90s soccer mom. He's got that that uh, that little short bob haircut and these really thick kind of um, librarian glasses. And and he is really excited to meet Bruce Wayne here. Jim Carrey plays uh, Edward Nigma. That is who his persona is pre-Riddler. Edward is really excited to meet Bruce Wayne. He's obsessed with Bruce Wayne. Like, absolutely loves him. It really seems like Jim Carrey is playing this guy as, as he has a crush on Bruce Wayne. He's really, really happy to meet him. And if I if, if this guy worked for me and he stormed up to me, and introduce himself as crazy as uh, Jim Carrey does, I would be like, thanks, man. Very, very, that's really nice of you. And then I'd turn to the guy and I'd be like, get him out of here. He's very manic. Like, he gets really excited and then really, really sad out of nowhere. A lot of the movies Jim Carrey did in the 90s, aside from maybe uh, Truman Show or something like that, they, they're really, he's really over the top. And he's kind of the same character in every movie. And this was, like I said, this is an extension of Ace Ventura. He is just going... Pretty much Ace Ventura in this entire movie. I think you're you're kind of right, but I think it's more accurate to say that he's more like the mask. Yeah. I think that Warner Brothers saw the mask and his green look, <laughs> and they saw they were looking at the Riddler costume before they cast it for it for the uh, character, and they were like, hmm, all that green, and we need like a really gregarious type of person to play the Riddler. <laughs> oh. Jim Carrey. He was just, we can just tell him to say, be the same person as he played in uh, The Mask. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because he is. He, he's jumpy and dancy and just like, yeah, over the top manic. Like he probably should have, he, sh he should probably be on medication. You're right. He, he could almost be an over caffeinated, um, slightly more paranoid Stanley Ipkiss. That's that's kind of what he is. Yeah. Um, and he's really excited to show, he's really excited to show Bruce Wayne his invention that he's made here. Paul. What what the hell is this thing? Uh, I honestly it looks like someone took a blender with some plastic little piping and they cut a bunch of things up and they put it inside the top of the blender and then there's literally egg beaters on one part of this thing too and there's like shoulder pads and it's it, it's almost like they tried to make a really half-assed version of Doc's machine that he made on on his head in um. Back to the Future. That's kind of what that looked like to me. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, that is exactly what it looks like. I, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think that's a coincidence. It's really weird. I don't understand this thing. And and if if you're going to try to sell me this, I would be like, why would you put this on your head? This thing, this thing is stupid. So he tells Bruce Wayne that he's trying to manipulate brainwaves 
in order to make the viewer feel like they are part of the television show. Um, you know, in hindsight, now we now know that he was just trying to make a, a 3D TV. And Bruce Wayne isn't quite sold on it because Bruce Wayne is really, really smart and knows that tampering with brain waves could lead to a lot of problems. I honestly don't understand any of this, how his machine works or what it does besides makes you feel like you're watching a 3D TV. Well, I mean, obviously, we're going to find out later that there is sort of a more sinister um, reason behind this, this invention. I don't really, I mean, they don't, they don't really explain who Edward Nigma is. You just kind of meet this guy really quickly and there's not a lot of backstory on him. Um, but he's a psycho and I would probably have him on some sort of watch list at my work I, or some sort of, some sort of reduced security clearance, I guess, you know, Bruce Wayne tells him that we can talk more about it. Just set up an appointment with my secretary and Edward Nigma says, that's not going to be good for me. And Bruce Wayne's like, well, then the answer is no. And then they part ways and Edward Nigma is completely crushed. What was so bad about just making an appointment and do it? Like, I don't understand why he needed to feel so defeated over being told that he has to make an appointment. Well, probably I think what would happen is, you know, obviously his um, his, secre his secretary would uh, either never get back to him or she would always say that Bruce is busy. So he's realizing that he'd probably never get the time of day. And re it's, it's realistically, Bruce is being, it's a polite no, but he's just pushing the issue because he is um, psychotic. Bruce Wayne, while he's standing here, he sees the bat signal and decides to go to his office. His office is approximately 20 feet away from Edward Nigma's desk. <laughs> like they're like in the same building. This time he, he ran into him just walking down the hall, walked by his desk. Yeah, they make it look like he's on the same floor, like he's got to walk past him every day. Maybe he just sort of does like a little, oh, I don't know, what, every day. Um, that's a good point. I don't know. That I mean... <laughs> that's, that's really funny. Um, but you know what? You know what I thought was weird, too, is once Bruce goes to his office, um, he just slides through a chute in the floor. And now he's in it's like a water slide. Yeah. And he's in some sort of like hyperloop. This 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 Elon Musk looking uh, hyperloop. And it's, it's just shooting him. It's just shooting him across the city now, across Gotham to Wayne Manor. And to me, I'm like, man, how, how do you <laughs> like you couldn't just dig this right this is because the the wayne tower looks like it's like 50 stories so this thing just shoots you down apparently 50 stories down a giant shaft that no one notices in this building goes into the floor across the entire city somehow he was able to tunnel across the entire city um missing all of the plumbing missing all of the power all of the gas subway lines and without anybody noticing to the outskirts of Gotham, where Wayne Manor is, and it just shoots him over there. It's amazing. I guess. I mean, like, uh, uh, how did how did people build this and they didn't know what the hell this was? Right. Like a tunnel that leads from Bruce Wayne's office directly to the Batcave. I feel like a lot of people would put two and two together. And right. Yeah. I mean, like, usually, I, I think the construction workers on that side would be like, "So, why are we doing this hole? Where's this going, dude? You know, someone would be like, "What? What? What is this thing?" And what is this? What is this giant tube? And and how does this work? God help you if you like go into his office to clean and sit in his chair by accident and end up getting shot down this tube and into the back cave. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. What if what if a cleaner just one day just sat down and because to activate that it just it's just the word chair. So what if someone some cleaner just sat there at the end of the day and was like, oh boy, that's a really comfy chair. Click and it ah! and they just get shot down to the bat. They get shot down to the back cave and they're like, wow. Oh. Where do you think this, how do you think this thing ends? Do you think it's like a water slide at the end? You just kind of, it's a little bit of splashing and then you sort of get out of it and it, the, the thing opens or does it ricochet you into like a wall or a trampoline, some pillows? I like to think that there's a giant crash mat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just shoots you out and you kind of skid and hit this little, this, uh, you know, gymnast mat or something. Yeah. Or it would be cool if it was, there was like a, a pool there, like a water park slide. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe a lazy river. You could just, it'll shoot you across there into the lazy river. And then it kind of comes out and Alfred hands you a pina colada as you get off the, the ride. Bruce Wayne suits up as Batman now. And he scoots down to the top of this building where I guess he's being called to. I guess where, the, where they where they hold the, the bat signal, right? Which I guess is where they're supposed to meet. That's just like, you know, that's their, that's their muster point, so to speak. 
They just show up and, and just coordinate. Hey, okay, go here for me. And then he has to go somewhere else. Wouldn't it just be easier to have the bat phone like in the Adam West series? So you think you call him and be like, hey, can you just show up here? And then when, instead of him having to drive all the way across town, and then what if what if what if he had to save something? What if he had to save someone's life and they were just beside Wayne Manor and he got all the way down there and was like, all right, what's the problem? And they're like, so you know where you live? Can you go just go back there for me real quick? And like three houses down, um, two faces trying to stab somebody. And he's like, all right, let me take my hyperloop. And he scoots down there. I don't know. Well, I guess we weren't really quite at the age where everybody had a cell phone. So I don't know if a landline would be any more efficient here in this this universe either but maybe he is the richest man in gotham that's true he should have a cell phone <laughs> you think this guy can't afford a, a i mean come on zach morris a high school a high school student had a cell phone yeah why does how does batman a billionaire not have a cell phone yeah you're right he should know better it's it's irresponsible i think i mean we're gonna see in this movie actually there's a, there's one point in this movie when i think bruce wayne acts uh irresponsible a couple of times so he shows up to the top of the building and who's there but the hot to trot Chase Meridian. This is just all an elaborate ruse for her to get up there and just get a little one-on-one -on -one time with the man in the rubber suit. The reason is because she wants to tell him that Two-Face is using his coin to choose whether or not he wants to kill people. And Batman's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you use the bat signal for this? <laughs> that's really irresponsible of you. <laughs> it's like the bat signal is serious. <laughs> it's for emergencies only. You should, you could have just called me. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You're right. I mean, it's like, yeah, we know lady. That's, that's two faces whole shtick. With that said, how was she supposed to get a hold of him without using the bat signal? Rob a bank. I guess so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> maybe that makes sense. Well, I mean, it's really, she has to have a gang. So it's gotta be her and maybe like three other people that rob a bank. And then, and then you got to have a gimmick too. So maybe that's way too much work. Maybe it is easier just to use the bad signal, right? Because then you got to pick a theme for what your costume is. This is where we find out that she is really into Batman. And Batman is starting to get into it too. And you can tell because his nipples are really hard. <laughs> you, can, you, can see it on, you can see it on the suit. Bruce Wayne had to make this costume special like extra room for his nipples for moments like this when he does get turned on and chase meridian is like what is it about the wrong kind of guy it used to be earrings motorcycles leather jackets and now and she like just gropes batman's chest and she's like oh black rubber it's a it's a definite Fifty Shades of Grey kind of vibe going on there. Um, yeah, and I, I was thinking too. I, Alfred later on remarks that he makes. Well, I mean, spoiler alert: when we get there. He makes a suit for Robin, so I'm assuming Batman. I'm assuming Alfred also made this suit for Batman. So, at some point, Alfred would have had to fit the suit with nipples to Val Kilmer. He would have had to have been like. Okay, so take off your shirt. And even like, all right, yeah, just uh, do this. And be like, is this necessary? So and he'd be like, yeah, yeah, it's going to look totally cool with my nipples. Out. You're going to see, yeah, they're going to really scare me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I do say, so this is quite awkward. He's like, yeah, you, you, you've seen the, you've seen worse. Come on, Alfred. Don't, don't be, don't be a buzzkill. <laughs> I, um, I did think that was really weird that that was the choice for this movie. Joel Schumacher, I, I did, I, I got to say, Joel Schumacher, I I was listening to the director's commentary and he didn't he didn't seem to think it was a big deal. He thinks people should just get over it. But whatever, as long as he's happy. I thought it was an interesting choice that they're like, you know what? This suit needs nipples. I, th I think it is odd. I don't know why the suit needs abs. Right. Yeah. It's just it's just a suit. I mean, we is that supposed to intimidate people? I guess so. It's right. It's just like he's just jacked. Maybe that's the idea. But it's already a guy in a back costume coming down from the rafters. I mean, this guy is already somewhat unhinged, you'd have to think, right? So Nicole Kidman is still hitting on him and Batman's kind of like shrugging it off and he's like, I don't fit in at family picnics. And Chase Meridian removes her coat to show that she's making, she's wearing a revealing kind of dress to try and turn Batman on, right? And she's like, well, why don't we do something else? I'll bring the wine. Commissioner Gordon shows up to see what the fuss was about. And Batman tells him that it was a false alarm. 
And Nicole Kidman looks at him and is like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and then Batman leaves. So I want to talk about Batman's exit for a second because in the new Batman movies, it was like kind of a running gag that every time Commissioner Gordon was done speaking with Batman, he would like turn his back for a second and turn and look back and Batman would just be like gone every single time. In this movie, they play like this epic music every single time Batman leaves. Like, and he doesn't even, he doesn't even try and hide at all. Like where he doesn't even try and sneak away. He like goes over to the edge of the building and fans out his giant bat wings from his cape or whatever. And then jumps off the movie or jumps off of the building and glides away. And they play like this, this epic star Wars type music every single time he does it. I think it's funny. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> It just doesn't, it doesn't. It just doesn't seem like he's sneaky at all for trying to hide who he is and stuff. Wouldn't it be funny if it was? Um, if he just had it. If he just had like. I mean, this movie's 1995. Wouldn't it be funny if it was just like an iPhone and he just had it playing music every time he was somewhere? He was just like, but it's really quiet. <laughs> and you're just like, what is he doing? He's just like, I don't know. He makes it. He thinks it makes him sound cool. He's like, yeah, this is real sweet. Yeah, see you guys later. He puts in like his, his earbuds. Yeah, I bet you it probably makes him feel really cool. <laughs> we should try and have epic exits like that. Maybe. I mean, I think you, it would definitely make your normal day just that much cooler, right? If you walked in. I honestly, I think I personally, I would love to have a hype man. Um, just someone with like a hype, you know, like someone that shows up with like a DJ with a hype horn with that. Bow, 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 bow. So you would just be having a normal day, but your day would just be that much more hype because you'd be like, hey, what are we having for dinner tonight? But someone be like, we're having tacos. Like, oh, bow, 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 bow. <laughs> it'd just be pumping your day up every day. Um, but after Chase Meridian basically invites Batman to fight crime in her pants and he sort of <laughs> refuses and jumps off the building and flies away, we're going to cut over to Jim Carrey now. So Edward Nigma, a.k.a. Jim Carrey, is in the lab and he's kind of, I don't know what he's doing. He's doing some soldering on his little blender hat, you know, and his boss from earlier this morning comes down and catches him. And it's like, this is probably like 10 o'clock at night. And somehow they're both hanging around the office. I mean, I can understand Jim Carrey hanging around the, the office, but why is his boss still walking around this late at night, making sure no one's there? You know, when you're like, all right, have a good day, guys. See you later. And he's just like, maybe he ate dinner. He's like, you know, that guy, Ed, was really creepy. Maybe maybe I should go down there and see if he's there. I, I don't know. Because it sounded like he was going to, he wanted to fire him that first day. I don't know why they just haven't escorted him out of the place or if you if you thought he was a problem why didn't you just be like all right buddy all right ed it's time to leave have a good night see you later you know and shuffle him out the door well he does go and tell him that he's going to kick him out because he's going to call security and as he's walking away jim carrey slams him on the head with a a coffee pot <laughs> i like that line when he falls down jim carrey goes caffeine will kill you <laughs> yeah <laughs> He's got he's got just a bunch of crazy one liners. I will say that as over the top as Jim Carrey is in this, like it's so campy. Some of his lines are pretty funny. Some of them. It's yeah, it's I mean, I, I really this is this is kind of around the time I was kind of starting to get a little tired myself of like, eh, does he need someone else? I don't I don't really know. But it is it it's just I think I think because he had there's so many other moving parts in this movie and it's not just Jim Carrey. Maybe that's why I wasn't so into this. I don't really know. But following him around for a whole movie is really fun. Him coming in and out and just being a complete wild man is, is something else. So after. After Ed's boss wakes up after being smashed in the head with the coffee pot, he's got this weird looking earnest P. Warhol kind of helmet on his head with a bunch of lights and stuff and wires. And Jim Carrey is wearing the blender helmet now and he throws a switch and this green lightning bolt thing starts happening. And I guess what's supposed to be is it's it's sucking out his it's not sucking his brain, but I guess it's I, this 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 machine because I'm, I'm confused now. I don't really know what this machine is supposed to be doing. I think it's supposed to be s supposed to be sucking his energy or his his IQ out. But it doesn't seem like Jim Carrey gets any smarter and this guy gets any dumber. No, it seems like it's making Jim Carrey more crazy, if anything. Yeah. Yeah, he, I, he says he's stealing his IQ, so you're right with, about that. Yeah, and it, it's not like he gets any smarter and his plans get any more brilliant or more devious in the movie as he gets more and more um, 
intelligence, I guess we'll say. He keeps he keeps draining more brains. And 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 it doesn't seem like anything long term happens to these people. Um, because once this guy turns the machine off, he still kind of he still knows who Jim Carrey is and he's still like, hey, get out of here. You know, you're gonna be in big trouble. So it still seems like he has his faculties. Yeah, he's completely lucid. Yeah. He doesn't seem like he's confused at all that he any of this took any kind of toll on him. Yeah. So I don't really understand what how this is supposed to be taking any of your your brain or your intelligence or anything like that. He still knows who Jim Carrey is, Edward Digma, and what he's doing, and tells him that he's fired. And <laughs> I thought it was hilarious that he told him that he was fired while as this boss is sitting in a chair completely tied up and vulnerable. He decides to fire the person who is holding him captive. <laughs> so, like, can you guess what's going to happen to him? Yeah, like this is this is really good leverage, buddy. <laughs> He's really going to believe you. You're in trouble. You're fired here. So Jim Carrey takes him and basically wheels him down the hall really fast and shoves him out the window and he falls down a waterfall <laughs> T- tied to a chair. And, like, and then he, he leaves a note the next day. We find out it's a suicide. Or he made it, he dressed it up as a suicide. This is why I, again, I don't think the cops in this town team seem too reluctant to actually try to solve any crimes. They're like, well, I don't know, Batman will take care of it. Forget it. We'll figure it out. Because the suicide note is kind of written like an email and just says to whom it may concern from this guy's name. And then it says, re my suicide. And then goodbye, cruel world. And that's it. And that is enough because uh, they get this this bulletproof piece of evidence and also this really bad security footage, which apparently shows this guy just running out the window. And I was confused about this. And later on in the movie, they kind of explain it, but it it, it really doesn't make any sense at all. While they're there, they also find a clue or should I say a riddle for Bruce Wayne? And it says, if you look at the numbers on my face, you won't see 13 any place. That's a tough riddle. A riddle that's only fit for a true detective like Bruce Wayne. That's right. The world's greatest detective in Batman. Right. So, of course, he knows that it's a face of a clock. I thought that that was a pretty weak riddle. Yeah, that was that was a really simple riddle. But in between all this stuff, there is a little quick backstory I guess we're going to get for Harvey Dent aka Two-Face because they play this in the form of a new story informing you and this also brings up a, a couple of questions here because I think if I remember correctly the mob, the mob boss Maroney is on trial here and Harvey Dent is is questioning him about some murders or something he's on trial here and all of a sudden Maroney throws a bunch of acid out and in a cup, and Tommy Lee Jones is able to put this manila folder to his face and sort of protect half his face while the other half is burnt. And and then all of a sudden, Batman just just like jumps out of the wing, and he just comes in and and, and kind of knocks knocks Two Face out of the way. And he's like, "Are they gonna get you?" Like, I, I I was wondering. I'm like, were they in the court before the the judge came out? He's like putting on his little robe and his wig, and all of a sudden he looks in the mirror and there's Batman like kind of huddled up against the wall in the closet. And he's like. I'm, I'm not here. Don't, don't worry about it. Just in case something happens, you know, like he's just he, like, he, was he like peeking around the corner? Like, oh, uh, oh my God, what's going on? And he like, he ran outside. I don't, I don't understand. I like to think that he was hiding under a bench <laughs> or just like behind the curtain <laughs> or, or something like that. Like nobody knew that Batman was in there and he was just like in a, like, in a clever little hiding spot. There's just two leather boots sticking out from underneath of the curtain. <laughs> and then there's just like, and then the top of the curtain, there's just two pointy black ears. <laughs> just waiting for someone to throw a cup of acid at, like someone. <laughs> just waiting for that moment. He's like, I know somebody's going to throw a cup of acid. I can feel it. Yeah. And also, how, I mean, how, how, did they, how did this guy Maroney get acid in there anyways, right? Did he just walk in with a cup and they're like, uh, sir, what is that? And he's like, it's apple juice. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. OK, so like like I, it doesn't make it is that again, it, is, is, is Batman the only cop in this town? The only form of law and order? Why does Two-Face hate Batman so much? That part doesn't make sense either. That Yeah, that doesn't explain at all why he decided to become a villain. He was a lawyer and someone threw acid in his face. So he was like, well, I'm going to be a super villain. <laughs> <laughs> like, just do the opposite. 
Well, yeah, I guess considering that you live in Gotham, this is kind of like your only choice, right? It's like, well, you could you could do construction, but you're now you're horribly disfigured. So it's like, well, I mean, now you got an angle, might as well be a super villain, right? Yeah, I don't think you necessarily have to stop being a lawyer either. I, I guess so. You, you'd have your own niche there, right? You'd be, I, I guess no one really wants to hear, no one wants to have Two-Face for a lawyer though, right? That doesn't sound great. I can be your Judge Judy or uh, Johnny Cochran. <laughs> Yeah, right, could you imagine? Face lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> it would just be like, it'd be like, my goodness, this is egregious. This is preposterous. I will not stand for this. And they'd be like, in the same breath, he'd be like, I don't do cell phones. You're a liar. Get out of here. I did wonder too, because it looks like Two Face, it, half his face, it looks like it's probably pretty crust, crusty and dry. It's like, you know, it doesn't look great. It looks horrible. So you gotta wonder, like, you think he's at, he's at home all the time putting lotion on his face and stuff when he comes out of the shower or he just leaves it? I think he probably has some some ointments. I think he could be the next he could be the next spokesperson for Avino or something like that. He'd be like, I use this daily moisturizer. I'd have to see his face heal a little bit before I before I believe that it <laughs> like Avino would actually work. Well, I don't could, know. He could he could do he could do a spot. He'd be like he'd be like I use Avino on this half of my face, and then turn to the camera and be like, "This half I did it." <laughs> <laughs> Avino, if you don't want to look like Two Face, use this. You know, boom, it sells itself. I'm just throwing this out here, but I think he'd be a good spokesperson. So Batman seems to be obsessed with Chase Meridian as well because Bruce Wayne decides he is going to make an appointment with Chase Meridian to kind of subtly talk about his trauma from uh, his parents being killed when he was a child. And he invites her to go to the circus <laughs> during their during their meeting. And, you know, she obliges. And I just wanted to mention that, like, I, th I think both of them are completely unprofessional. Like, Bruce Wayne as Batman is tricking this girl into thinking that they're two different people. And this psychologist who is trying to help Bruce Wayne is also willing to go on a date with him and like get close. That's like really unprofessional, isn't it? Like you're not supposed to date your patients. I suppose. I don't know if she's your patient, if she's working, they're working together. Maybe. I don't know. That's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. So they go to the circus. And this, this circus really does look like a Tim Burton circus. I think anyways, this is, this is wacky what we get treated to here. This is like, it, it, this is, you know, you know, the circus, um, well, there was like a casino in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and Hunt and Hunter S. Thompson and Dr. Gonzo are just tripping out. That's kind of what this circus reminded me of. Yeah, I could see that. It's really odd. I, I have never seen a circus like this in my lifetime. So again, that's oh, another reason why I think that this circus, like, or this, this movie takes place in like 1960 Gotham. But that's that's the thing, though, because it's televised. And that's what's weird, too, is like, what else is going on in this town? Why is why is nothing going on in this town? You know, like the the, the circus is the, the circus is the biggest thing that they need to watch on TV and televise everybody. The Riddler is watching it on TV. I'm I'm yeah. Why is anybody watching the circus on TV? I don't know. It doesn't right? like it, there's not Jeopardy on or or like a sports game. There's nothing that they need to sit there and watch the flying Grayson swing around. And do they do this every Friday? Is this is this like the Grand Ole Opry or something? And they just have this this weekly thing where they're just like, it's Gotham tonight. Here we're at the circus town again, you know, and, and people are coming out and juggling machetes or whatever. I don't know. You know, the ringmaster looks like Ben Stiller. That's what I was thinking. I saw this guy and I was like, this is Ben Stiller. <laughs> OK, perfect. Not long after the ringmaster introduces the first act, the Flying Graysons, we see him getting kidnapped backstage. Um, by the way. The Flying Graysons. I, I think I don't know if this is clever or not, but like maybe not with this movie. Their outfits, their matching outfits as acrobats, is basically Robin suit from the 1960s Batman TV show. Yeah, with pants instead of shorts, though, which is like thank God. <laughs> I don't want to see Chris O'Donnell in short shorts. <laughs> no, I suppose not. It's you like it, you like him better in tights. Uh, you, um, I mean, yeah, well, his, his nipple suit is really hot. I got to say <laughs> <laughs> his nipples aren't as big as Batman's though. No, no, no. Come on. It's all Batman's always gonna have the bigger set of nipples. <laughs> That's just how it is. 
He's, he's numero uno. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah, they got the they got the same suit. So while the the flying Graysons are doing their act, it's a family of four, by the way. It's Dick Grayson, his brother, and their parents. Two Face dressed as the ringmaster and proceeds to just get, get the microphone and talk to the crowd and tell everybody that there's a bomb that's going to go off in two minutes, and. Okay, there's so many things I want to talk about right here because this is just so, so foolish. Why, why would you tell everybody what your plan is? Why does he need to grab the microphone and show himself to everybody? There's like eight of his henchmen around with guns and nobody is doing anything. Where are the police officers? Commissioner Gordon is standing right beside Batman, Bruce Wayne. And he's just not doing anything. He's like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? That's a good point. Yeah, you think he should have a phone or he should be able to do something and call someone, right? Um, but I, again, I, that's why we're, we're going to see through this. It's just Batman who is the only piece of law and order in this entire town. I don't know. I just, okay, sorry. So there's something I noticed in this movie. While um, Two-Face is giving this speech, his wardrobe that he has, like half his wardrobe just looks like there's like this weird tumbleweed kind of stuff on his suit. And then there's like half camo and stuff. Um, but he's got this, I, I don't know what you call it, an epaulette, I think is what it is. It's like a shoulder pad, right? And there's like bullets on it and something hanging off it. But the bullets on the top of this thing, if you guys pause this movie and freeze it, it's at 3731. Someone fact check me and tell me I'm wrong here. But it looks like on, on Two Faces' shoulder... There's bullets in the shape of a dick on his shoulder. Like some, someone, someone's got to fact check me on this because maybe I'm just seeing things here. But this is this is a classic boner shape. It's got a wide body and then a pointy little skinny shaft in the middle and it circles up and around. They put a dick on Tommy Lee Jones's shoulder in this movie. That's what that's what this thing looks like. Someone fact check me. Get back at me. Let me know, but there is a penis on Two Face's shoulder. I think they snuck that one in there. Looking at that shot, I also just realized that his hat is even like Two Face themed. Like his whole wardrobe is half and half, right? Like it looks like he's wearing two different costumes cut down the middle, but and, and wearing like two different ones side at the same time. I don't understand why. Like just of logic in these movies, why would? Why do the villains go out of their way to dress like they do? That's what I was wondering, too. It seems like that's what I mean. Like, it seems like Gotham is sort of the major leagues for villains. That's why they're all super villains. So you have to come there. It's like you can't just show up and rob a bank. You have to show up and rob a bank with like a costume, a theme. You need colors. You need henchmen and maybe some sort of lair too. you know, these are a couple of things you got to set up shop. Maybe there's like papers you got to write up. Maybe there's like a union. They have a super villains union that you can join before you can start working legally there or illegally, I guess, in, in Gotham. You know, they're like, hey, let me see your card, bud. Are you paid up on your dues? So Two-Face tells everybody that this giant bomb he has is going to blow up in two minutes unless Batman, who he assumes is definitely in this audience, stands up and reveals himself, like reveals his true identity. And as soon as he says that, Jim, we cut, we cut to Jim Carrey as the Riddler at home watching this on TV. And just to give you an idea of like his overacting and stuff, here's his reaction to that. <laughs> <laughs> just by himself, I just think it sounds so funny. Just screaming. Yeah. They're... It'd be funny to see the retakes of him doing that over and over and over. That would be really tough, I imagine, right? Just, oh, it would be brutal. But Two Face now has this bomb, which this this whole bomb thing kind of confused me and made no made no sense. Again, there's so many times Two Face could have just killed Bruce Wayne slash Batman and doesn't. And say right here, you you could have taken this bomb and just blown up everybody right in the middle. Just leave it on the floor. You have to do any extra hoisting and rigging and and setting up stuff with cables or whatever. You don't have to do any of that. It's any planning. It's just just leave the bomb there. But instead they hook it up to a, like a steel cable and start raising it up in the air as if blowing it up in the air is going to do more damage. And I thought maybe at first I'm like, oh, because, you know, maybe the, the structure of this place will fall down and it'll crush everybody. And there is some steel, but I forgot too. This is also a tent. This is a tent. 
It's a tent. Oh, like it's just a bunch of fabric. And there's going to be some like this, some of the steel will hurt people, too. Right. But I really think you would do more damage if you just left this bomb on the ground. I just want to say that this bomb looks like it's straight out of the Looney Tunes. And it has a competition clock like that you'd see in an arena on it, like at a hockey game or something like a scoreboard clock inside of it and that, that's kind of that's kind of it honestly i thought it was a throwback to the i thought this was this part and the part coming up were a bit of an homage to um the batman the original batman movie oh my gosh you're right with adam west where you know it's a what do you say it's it's you, you can't you can't throw a bomb around what do you say i think that's what it was yeah i think it's geez it's hard to find a place to find a to throw a bomb these days something like that but yeah he was carrying around the the same bomb I think that's what this was. This was kind of an homage to this sort of goofy, um, you know, car- cartoons kind of style Batman. And so, so the Graysons are up on their bird perches there, and they're uh, they're like, you know what? Forget it. We can we can save the day here. Let's just do this. But they don't really. They all they say is we can stop him, and everyone just jumps away. No one discusses like, hey, okay, so you should go up here. You should go over here. They all just somehow instinctively knew what they were going to do, and they all start scaling the trusses of this tent, and. It's kind of at this point, two faces henchmen see what they're doing and open fire on them. And Robin is able to get to the top without being shot, thankfully, as the bomb gets up there. Meanwhile, unfortunately for his family, it looks like they've fallen now and to their doom. So we don't, we don't obviously don't see that because it's a kid's movie and they don't want to scare you, but that's kind of what's implied there. At this point, now this is kind of, again, the homage to the Batman movie where the, just the top of this building opens up. There's a hatch. Uh, there's a, a bomb-sized hatch up on the top of this roof. He's able to just... Chris O'Donnell, who is apparently... I don't know. I guess he's 18, but he looks like he's 26. Uh, opens this hatch up and then throws the bomb off the side of the building into the water before it explodes and saves the day. Edward Nigma at home is watching all of this on TV and loving it. They're broadcasting the takeover of the circus on TV. <laughs> Yeah, potentially a, a bomb explosion and, and a massacre on live television. They're like, this is great TV. Just don't don't move. Yeah, it's like everybody stick with it. You do the camera like get, get two faced, get up close. That's a good point. I don't I mean, yeah, you think they should just not cover that. But I think, again, you know, if you live in Gotham, that's just part of what happens here. You just got to accept, you know, that's just you're, you're rolling the dice. Sometimes you go out for dinner or you go out to the circus and uh, maybe a supervillain is going to show up and take the place hostage. And. Adding to your point, too, about the bomb on the inside. So ultimately, your goal is to kill Batman. And you're assuming that Batman is at this circus. So if you're willing to assume that, like that Batman's at the circus as Bruce Wayne. Again, like you said, why don't you just set the bomb off? Why do you need to put a timer on it and have Batman reveal himself? Yeah, right. I don't know. Um I don't know why some people didn't quietly just try to like sneak out the back and lift up the tent and sneak out under it. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't, I'm not a professional tentist, so I couldn't figure that part out. And by the way, while this is all going on, Bruce Wayne is kicking the crap out of all the henchmen in front of everybody. He is in the middle of the circus auditorium tent thing and just kicking the crap out of the henchmen. And nobody wonders that, <laughs> whether or not he's Batman. Yeah, that really rich guy, he's a, he's a really good fighter, eh? Yeah. So unfortunately, as Robin has saved the day, he discovers that his parents are now dead. And his and his brother. His whole family is dead. So the next day he shows up to Bruce Wayne's place. He shows up to the Wayne Manor. And it looks like reluctantly he is going to stay with Bruce Wayne, at least for a little bit. And Commissioner Gordon's there and he's saying, hey, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking him in. And I mean, Chris O'Donnell <laughs> in this movie just... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how, how I don't know how old he's supposed to be in this movie. At one point, Bruce Wayne does call him a college student, but I really feel like he's a, he's maybe 18. He's supposed to be 18. But man, he looks he looks like he's in his mid 20s. OK, when <laughs> so when 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 Commissioner Gordon drops him off, he says that he's been filling out paperwork and stuff for hours and dealing with social workers. And when they get inside. He also tells Bruce Wayne that he is just going to leave because he doesn't want to deal with any more social workers. So that to me implies that he's like an orphan and is worried about falling into the system. Now, I know he's not supposed to be like a 10 year old or a 12 year old, but none of that makes sense to me. You know, wow. Actually, 
You know, that that's actually a good point because if you're probably 18, you're probably old enough that you can, you're not, you're now your own. Um, yes. You're, you're, you're old enough that you can speak on behalf of yourself. You don't need a guardian, right? So that's a good point, actually. Yeah, I think you get emancipated below a certain age, like not as an adult. Yeah, that's a good point. So, yeah, I mean, I, huh, now I'm, now I really got to rethink this because later on, Bruce Wayne calls him a college student, but if he's got social workers to deal with, how the hell is this guy? Is he like Doogie Howser? Is he really smart? And maybe it's, maybe it's like, maybe he's Benjamin Button. The the Robin is Benjamin Button. He just looks this old. Because yeah, I, I, I did the math. Uh, Chris O'Donnell in this movie at this point is 24 years old, 24, 25 years old. So in real life. I Yeah, in real life. The, so there's no way this dude is 17 years old. And he, he's the most annoying orphan ever. I hate to say it, but it just like, he is just an ungrateful prick. Oh, he's a crybaby. Yeah. And he's just annoying. And then also he just calls Alfred Al. Al. Hey, Al. Hey, Al. Make me a sandwich, Al. Take this bag, Al. You know, like if if I was Alfred in this movie, there's a lot of points in this movie. I would just be so pissed off with this guy. I'd be like, get this kid out of here. Well, he is going to leave, but Bruce convinces him to stay by offering him a free, very rare motorcycle. If he wants to stay and fix one of his motorcycles up and he'll give him another motorcycle as a gift. Dick Grayson's just like a whiny kid who needs to be bribed to do anything. He decides to stay. And then there's like this heart to heart moment with Alfred and Bruce, where Bruce is talking about his childhood past, about his parents dying. It really doesn't have anything to do with anything. But when that's over, Bruce Wayne sees the bad signal in the sky. So Batman to the rescue. He arrives in town driving along and then two uh, of uh, two faces henchman vehicles are behind Batman and they're like shooting at him while he's driving. When the bat signal shines in the sky, like where is, does Batman just, how does he know where to go? That's what I don't know. I thought he had to show up to the roof where the bat signal was and they'd be like, okay, man, can you go over here? And there's this spot by Dairy Queen and, and stop them. And then he's like, oh yeah, okay, I'll go over there. That's what I thought it was. I, I thought he, this is just like, he's just driving around the city and, and he just, and that's it. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. So he's, he's driving and there's two vehicles behind him and, you know, he's kind of screeching around corners and stuff. And then there's this old lady with like, a little kind of a blanket type veil over her face. And she's push, pushing a, a carriage with presumably a baby in it. And Batman slams on the brakes. And lo and behold, it's Two-Face in a dress. And he reveals that it's a rocket launcher. A dynamic dual dresser, a two-faced rocket, the Dark Knight nipples meeting at a point Will Dr. Chase Meridian finally get her hands on? Oh, black rubber. For these answers, stay tuned. Same bad movie, same good time. I don't mind the work. <laughs>